title of our presentation is Strain Capacity of Strain Hardening UHPC Composites with Steel Fibers. Again, my name is Tony Naman. I'm Professor Emeritus at the University of Michigan. My co-author on this presentation is Professor Shah, uh, University of Texas at Arlington and also Northwestern University. Uh, I want to first point out that the title of this presentation came as part of a discussion we had um, last year at the ACI convention and in which the issue of what is the strain capacity for design we use with UHPC. So the, the subject came out of, as a part of a discussion we had at the ACI convention on a similar um, uh, session in which the issue of what is the strain capacity for UHPC. And at the time, I remember having given some of my, some information I had. And Professor Shah mentioned that they had done some work at the University of Hong Kong in which they had strain capacities of the order of 80 over 1,000 or 0.8%. Uh, so at, at the time, we then decided, uh, we talked after the session with Saru, decided that we should look into the matter a little bit more. And as a result, uh, we ended up looking not only at UHPC data, but also all, practically all strain hardening uh, FRC materials, including SHFRC, HPFRC, Doctal, SIFCON, SIMCON, etc. But first, let's to be on the same wavelength, uh, I would like to describe here the tensile, typical tensile stress strain curve of a strain hardening FRC composite. All our data are for strain hardening composite. It's composed of three branches, the initial branch, linear elastic up to A, the, it, the stress keeps increasing, with multiple cracking up to point B. At point B or nearby, we have localization. After that, the stress decreases, in which case we have either fiber failure or fiber pull out or in between. What's important in this particular uh, figure is that the strain capacity is obtained by looking at the elongation between the zero point and the peak point and dividing that by the gauge length, but that elongation includes the crack width that is in the multiple cracking region. And as a result, in fact, what you get is a strain capacity, which I here consider at the peak load, that is a re a really a, sm a, 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 a smeared strain, which we will use, in, for, in, for instance, in model. Okay, next slide, I would like to, to ask what is why is it so important? And it, it may have come in the previous um, uh, presentation. This is the ACI strain diagram at ultimate for flexural member for reinforced and pre-stressed concrete. You notice at nominal bending resistance, and you notice the strain at the level of the reinforcement here on the bottom. We have three region. One is a strain increment less than 002, one is more than 005 and in between region. And if we are in the less than 002, ACI um, penalizes us with a flow fee factor. If we are more than 005, ACI allows us to use a high fee factor. And this is really where the desirable properties are. Now keep in mind, 002 is two over a thousand, 005 is five over a thousand. And these two limits are gonna come in many of my uh, incoming slides. So now we go to the next uh, uh, slide here, where I show a typical uh, stress strain curve of UHPC materials uh, taken from a recent study by Abraham Shimba and co author Here I show a curve, the first curve is really flat, as you could see. Uh, about 9.6 megapascal and a strain of 2.4 over 1,000. The other curve is for well-oriented fibers. So we already can see that there is a difference in behavior when the fibers are random or well-oriented. This one will give me 16 megapascal at a strain of 4.1 over 1,000. Now, in this particular instance, I would like to point out that some people sometimes use a localization point 
somewhere near the peak to determine the strain, and that will be the subject of another slide here coming up for a discussion. Now let's look at this uh, five curve obtained by Grebel and Babi, in which they show the initial curve, and then the average curve is in black, and typically the maximum point or the peak point is at this level here where I show it, 3.3 over 1,000. However, if I'm a structural engineer, I want to design a beam, perhaps I could decide that I'm going to use the strain capacity here, 6 over 1,000. Now, it is not very well defined how these things are done. For this presentation, I simply use the peak point as a strain capacity. And if it wasn't given, I went to the actual curve uh, and I picked them up. So first results. These are results on 26 series of tests taken from the group of FHWA by Grebel and Bobby, Grebel, Haber and co-author and Maya Duque and Ota, co-author. All use the same specimen cross-section testing procedure. All the data are shown here. You notice the two over a thousand, you notice the five over a thousand, the data are for steel fiber, smooth steel fiber, 2 to 4 percent, and some of them have different length and diameter and so on. Most important is that we observe what I call here a best fit line, but it's really not what we want to use. It's not a best fit in a sense, you predictive line. It's a trend line. And the trend line tells me very clearly that the higher the post cracking tensile strength, the higher the strain capacity. Now, for this particular data, the average came up to be 3 over 1,000 strain and 9.21 megapascal average stress. Now, next slide, here I show the data from 21 series of tests taken from six different investigations. The names are given here. And again, if you notice, the 2 over 1,000, 5 over 1,000, most of the data fall in between. The average here is a little bit higher, 3.33 over 1,000 for 13.8 megapascal maximum strength. By, by the way, when I reviewed many, many data, in the past, although we had the data, we never plotted the data as a strain versus stress in this fashion. And if somebody knows of anybody who did it, please let me know because I would like to refer to their work in my publication. Now, this is another set of data taken from Suji Vorakul and Kim about 15 years ago on large HBFRC specimen, basically strain hardening composite. The, these specimens are quite large, 22 inches uh, long, two inches by one in cross section. And we see here again the same trend, the higher this, the post racking tensile strength, the higher the strain. However, here our average is a bit larger, 4.08 over 1,000. And we notice that all the specimens they have tested are with deformed fibers, here in this case, hooked and twisted fibers. I move to the next slide. Now, this is another set of data, again, from uh, more than 15 years ago by Suji Rovakul on what he called small tensile specimen. These are only one inch by one inch in cross section. And again, you see the data, the trend, same trend as before. Here, however, we are observing some data way above the five over a thousand. Not surprising because we have smaller specimen and also because we have most of the uh, uh, fibers are deformed. Average uh, the, uh, strain capacity 5.13 over a thousand, stress 6.22 megapascal. I move to the next slide. I went back up to 35 years ago with tests we have done with SIFCON. And here I have 17 series of SIFCON, uh, nine, eight, 87, 97, 2002. Of course, you have to be old to get to that. And as a result, again, the trend, I plot them here, the trend is not as sharp, but still the trend is there where the higher the strain, the higher the strength, the higher the strain. The average point here, by the way, is 11.3 over a thousand for a stress of 19.3 megapascal. And these specimens are quite large in cross section. They are 3.3 inches by 1.5 inch. So it's relatively large to many of the smaller 
specimen we have seen earlier. Now here is summary of all these results. 97 test uh, series of tests, 20 different investigations taken over 35 years period. For all strain hardening materials, we see the UHPC groups here. We have two groups of them. We have the large HPFRC, the small HPFRC, the CIFCON. And all of them would satisfy the conclusion that if you increase the strain, the strength, you increase the strain capacity. And now I move to the conclusions. The first conclusion is almost evident from what uh, we have discussed so far. And these rely to USPC with steel fibers only. Assuming same testing procedure and specimen sizes, but independently of numerous other factors, such as in this case, in our case, fiber length and diameter and whether it's twisted or not, the higher the post-cracking tensile strength, the higher the corresponding strain. So this is unlike what we see with steel, for example, when, when we increase the strength, we decrease the strain. Here is the other way around, and that is explained by the fact that in the multiple cracking region, when the stress increases, we have more cracks, the crack width is included in the strain capacity that we have calculated. Second, left. Yes. So the second conclusion is that for USPC with small steel fibers at 2 to 4% fiber content, achieving a strain capacity in excess of 5 over 1,000 is a real challenge at this time. And that may explain some of the results we have seen with the, in the previous presentation about, say, the bending behavior and, and so on. Everything else being equal, fibers with slip hardening bond characteristic. These are fibers that are mostly deformed, such as hooked or twisted, lead to a higher tensile strain capacity. These, this, I don't have the time to explain, but these are in the data, and if needed, I could explain more. And a sufficient strain capacity in excess of five over a thousand is, in our opinion, key to the success of UHPC in reinforced and pre-stress concrete structural application and would likely justify their initial costs. Again, I don't have time to explain more about this because when you reduce the size of a structure, you also, because if it's a UHPC, you also reduce the size of other costs and that is uh, influences the final result. And now here is a not a conclusion, but a very important recommendation. There is need to provide a standard or unified specification on how to determine the strain capacity at peak for design. For instance, the point on the stress strain curve at 95% of maximum stress achieved before that point. So here I look when it's flat, you see, you look at this point, when it's very flat, uh, this point gives you 40% more strain. I have here some tests with spectra fiber, and Professor Shah will talk more about synthetic fiber, where if I take the point at 95%, I get 25% more strain. So there is a need to standardize this, and so we can all follow the same procedure. 